Good day to you. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com here. It is now Monday, the 24th of July, 2023. I'm back in Las Vegas, part of my Southwest tour, doing some testing. Uh, I wish I could make this video like an hour long and fill you in on everything that we've done, but we'll do that another time. Uh, just a real quick summary, testing Starlink out here and the ability to bond cellular with Starlink using a product called Speedify. No, they are not a sponsor. It's something that we had purchased. Some of our crowdfunding partners did, and we've been testing that with tremendous results, able to stream live video. That's obviously important, but maybe equally important, being able to download data so we know what's going on, right? Doing this in even the most remote areas of the desert southwest. Why did we do it out here? It's hot. It's inhospitable. We have monsoon thunderstorms, so that gives us some real life, sort of live fire exercise, if you will. These opportunities to do this testing very important because hurricane season is probably going to be ramping up here in the Atlantic Basin over the coming weeks, and we want to be as ready as we can be. All right, so let's get on with today's update. We have a few areas that we are watching and a very powerful typhoon in the Western Pacific that's going to impact portions of northern Philippines and then eventually maybe southern parts of Taiwan and mainland China from there. So let's get started. Good to have you join me on this Monday. Getting ready to be another hot one out here in the southwest, but that's okay. We're ready for it. All right, so in the Atlantic Basin, here is the post-tropical dawn. Hey, it became a hurricane over the weekend. I said I thought that it had a chance a few days ago. Now, that's not the same as planting your flag and saying, I forecast this to become a hurricane. I realize that, but it just had that look overall. And these systems that get up here in the subtropical Atlantic where water temperatures are marginally favorable, and then you've got the Gulf Stream that snakes its way through. Yeah, magical things can happen with the atmosphere and the ocean, and certainly Don took advantage of that and became a hurricane very briefly. Here's 95L. Very little chance that this goes on to develop into a named storm but we need to think about impacts, okay? And this will bring impacts to our friends in the Lesser Antilles starting today and through tomorrow. We'll look at that closer as we move on, all right? Just wanted to come back on and make sure you see me because impacts are important. Names, classifications, categories, those are important too. But at the end of the day, like I say, I want you to be selfish. Hey, how will this affect me? And yes, 95L will affect you if you're down in parts of the Lesser Antilles. So here it all is on the satellite animation. There would be the leftovers of Don up there. There's 95L. It's getting larger overall in its moisture envelope, or at least its presence on satellite animation here from Tropical Tidbits. Uh, but it's spread out. It's not consolidating. But you know what? Again, that doesn't matter. We have to get away from this mindset that if it's not a Category 3, 4, or 5 hurricane, it doesn't matter. The, nothing could be further from the truth. This is going to bring rainfall, gusty winds, squally conditions to the areas down here in the eastern Caribbean islands. So be ready for that. It's very important. Let's look at it uh, a little bit closer here on the high-res visible. Not a lot of organization with it, but again, so what? All of these bubbling convective blobs in here, thunderstorms, create downburst winds, very heavy rainfall underneath, and that could affect some of these islands that have hills and mountains. They are not flat like the Florida Everglades. So just be mindful of this in the windwards, the leewards, the, uh, that, the whole chain down there. If we go back to the larger satellite shot, it's a pretty large area of energy and moisture, the tropical wave outlined right there in satellite. So just be ready. All right, you guys know down there. I'm just reminding you, but maybe people that are visiting or just moved there and they don't think that a tropical wave is a big deal, it can be. Ask anybody, Trinidad, Tobago, elsewhere, you guys know? All right, spread the word, let people know. All right, another perspective of this, uh, got a couple of blobs associated with it right here on the vorticity signature, not a sign that it is consolidating. Hey, look, even though it's going post-tropical, draw your attention over here to dawn, that is what I'm looking for. I wish I could remove that symbol out of there, but that's okay. That's what I'm looking for. And you guys probably know this by now. You've watched me long enough. If it's stretched out 
and kind of amorphous like this. Nope, that's not going to do it. This is all vorticity or energy that is stretched out over a long distance. It's not bundled like Dawn up here over cold water. But yes, the low level of vorticity or spin in the atmosphere of the framework is there. There's a little bit of framework down here, but it's not concentrating, it's not consolidating, and so it's probably not going to develop into a depression or a storm. But again, who cares? It could be uh, a big impact maker with rain and gusty winds and even lightning with some of those thunderstorms. So this is what it looks like on the GFS. This is the 12Z. 12 Zulu time coming in right now. That is what the energy looks like in the GFS, where at the 850 millibar level. By the way, I just want to tell you a quick aside. Yesterday while we were traveling, my colleague Mike Cornelius is with me. A lot of colleagues on this trip. It's, it's great. Uh, Matt and Paul and now Mike. And we were traveling around. If you know the Southwest, you go up and down, even the West in general. And they put these elevation signs. They do that back east too. 4,000 feet, 5,000 feet, so forth and so on. Well, remember, 5,000 feet is generally when the atmosphere is normal, 850 millibars. So if you had a barometer, which I happen to have with me, I mean, why wouldn't I? And we were at 5,000 feet, or you go to 5,000 feet with a barometer, it should say 850 millibars, right? And that's exactly what ours said yesterday. And I'm going to show you today, I'm going to take a picture. I know that our route today we're going to go be, be going through some of the high plateau areas of northern Arizona. And there's an area out there. I know there's a sign that says 5,000 feet. And I'm going to pull over and I'm going to take a picture, Mike Will, of the Kestrel output. And it should say around 850 millibars. I just think that'll be kind of neat. Anyway, there's that little aside. Thank you for coming to my non-TED talk. All right. So, yes, 850 millibars is 5,000 feet in the atmosphere. And there's not much... Uh, you know, organization, right? I showed you that on the satellite and the vorticity. That's a satellite product, too. And it verifies on the GFS. So let's just move this out into time. Look at that energy, those yellows and oranges. They move through the eastern Caribbean. We back it up there. See, it goes through. So, yes, there will be impacts from Guadalupe south from there, all the way down the island chain. So be ready. Not so much up in the northern islands, British, U.S., Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, maybe the northern extent of the wave. Uh, this is about 48 hours out. And then finally, 72, it moves into the Western Caribbean. And at 102 hours, there's just not much there. All right? Let's broaden the shot out a little bit, the extent, if you will. This goes out to 102 hours as well. And let's just take a look. There's the wave down there that we're watching, 95L. There is more energy coming off Africa over here. You can see how it has sort of this pouch here. Everything's kind of curled up. Uh, nice monsoon trough action coming this way. Uh, reduction in trade winds. It's very favorable out there at the low levels. But if we can get the mid-level dry air out and the upper levels cooperate, then, yes, we're going to start to have tropical development. And, by the way, we don't want to ignore Don. There's the low-level vorticity for post-tropical Don. So let's just move this out and watch how everything moves and, and advances over time. This one is really interesting right here. You see what starts to happen. Um, let's just go to 96 hours. This right here definitely has my attention. The GFS, and I know it has cried wolf several times this year. And, you know, are we going to get bitten again, so to speak? Hard to say. We just never know when... These models, and yes, they change them. They tweak the models each year. Sometimes stuff works. The next year it doesn't. There's different biases that they have. It's all math and crazy physics that are way beyond my pay grade. But the GFS has been pretty consistent in trying to develop another system. And yeah, we got to be cautious because it has been aggressive. But to be fair, so was the Euro. The Euro Ensemble Prediction System, EPS for 95L, was also pretty aggressive with it on some of the members there. It wasn't like the Euro showed nothing and the GFS was all these strong hurricanes and we're also talking about pretty far out into time. But what about the next five days? If we can just focus on five days and hopefully the global models get that right, then maybe we can have some believability as it were in what we're seeing. So at the 850 level, 850 millibars at 96 hours, that's what we're showing. 
what does it look like in the moisture uh, areas? What's the moisture look like? So we go over here and 700, 300 millibar relative humidity. Now that's pretty telling right there where it's all curled up like that. So if this comes to fruition, this is four days out, we're going to keep score. And uh, Matt, our colleague from uh, near Denver, this was a good suggestion from him. Let's kind of keep score. This is what the GFS is saying today. Four days from now, let's see if that's what it looks like out there in reality. So I'm going to save that image, and when I do my update Thursday, we're going to take a look at that. All right? So something else to watch. Like I said, a few areas to watch. That's why it says that in the thumbnail over the coming days as that starts to scoot uh, across the Atlantic there. Uh, now this goes out to almost five days. It does try to ramp that up, so we've got to watch that. And by the way, pretty cool that you can see the moisture envelope and the tropical wave look. And then there's that other one that I just showed you. So yes, some activity now starting to percolate, as it were, across the Atlantic Basin. Nothing concerning yet, but we're getting ever closer, I think. And a big reason, oh man, these anomalies still holding very strong. By the way, that's upwelling. Don chewed away at some of those anomalies. Now you have below normal water temperatures in an isolated area of the subtropical North Atlantic there. Our El Nino holding on, but not really strengthening. We're not stretching all this out to the west. It is kind of stuck in the eastern part of the Pacific. I think the dice are loaded. We are ready to go. It's going to be a very busy August and September, in my opinion. I think everything is pointing in that direction. I could be wrong, but I really believe what we're seeing here is going to set the stage for a lot of activity over the coming two to three months. It just makes sense, despite the El Nino. Again, the Reynolds method here, this really highlights it. All of this, one degree Celsius and higher, and then look at this, two degrees Celsius. That is, you just don't see that very often. And then up here, this is really crazy. Five Celsius above normal. Man, I would love to hear from anybody. I'm serious. You know how they say, the big YouTubers, leave a comment. You know, Tell me in the comments, right? Reply in the comments. Anybody that has friends or family or you yourself are in the fishing fleets up in Atlantic Canada, uh, or, I mean, it might be, I don't know fishing up there. Uh, I just know the movie The Perfect Storm. Do they start coming out of Gloucester, Mass now? But bottom line, is this warmth five Celsius above normal in the Northwest Atlantic, are we seeing impacts to fishing and the marine life up there? I know that's not totally what we're about here, but it is all connected. And I think that's very curious um, as that anomaly is very strong. I'd love to hear from you. So seriously, let me know or hit me up on Twitter or whatever Elon's calling it today. <laughs> and, uh, don't even, nope. Um, and let me know, please, seriously. All right, moving on along, Gulf of Mexico. I mean, I just, I can't. I can't just wrap my brain around 31 Celsius all through here. Absolute, just, that's too warm. A couple islands, thankfully small of, uh, <laughs> forgot my scale, 32 Celsius. Shouldn't laugh because it's, it's very serious for a lot of reasons. 31 surrounding all of the western peninsula areas of Florida, 32, wow. If we, you just know, you know what could happen, and we better hope that it doesn't. I'm dead serious. This is, we've already talked about it ourselves as a team, that it is possible when the atmosphere cooperates with these types of water temperatures, that we could see something that would be beyond our ability to deal with it, like we'd have to set our equipment up and truly get out of the way. Now, Got to be careful. We don't want to start putting the cart before the horse. Warm water temperatures alone do not give you intense hurricanes. You have to have a lot of other things come together. But that is a giant area. Most of the Gulf up there near land is way above where it should be. 30, 31 Celsius, 32. I'm starting to get concerned. I am. And you don't ever hear that from me, right? Unless it's something that's worthy of being concerned about. Meanwhile, along the East Coast and elsewhere, water temperatures coming up finally. Took a while earlier in the summer, 28, 29 Celsius right up against the coast now, even up into the Northwest Atlantic. 
well, up against the mid-Atlantic coast itself, but the northwest Atlantic Ocean. Yep, water temperatures coming up as well. Uh, 25, 26 Celsius, or about 78, 79 Fahrenheit off of Jersey, Delaware, and Maryland and vicinity. Not too bad. You know, you got up till Labor Day that temperatures up there still go up in the ocean. That's a ways away. It might hit 80 up there. We shall see. All right, so to wrap everything up as quickly as I can, told you I'd be back Monday with a lot to talk about, and here I am. Luckily, on the one hand, we are chewing away at these pinks in here. This color here, uh, or whatever that is, um, the excessive heat warning is not quite as widespread because we do have the monsoonal moisture. And that is easily seen, at least in this product uh, set up here from the Storm Prediction Center. Uh, this really gives you a good outline. This is from the southwest monsoon through here. This is all from other weather features. It's not that I don't care, but I'm in the southwest, and it's your job to care. And look at these areas of marginal and slight if you live there and plan accordingly. But I'm out in the desert southwest today, by the way. We're going to leave Vegas. We're going to cut up through here down roughly through this area, and then end up back in Flagstaff. And this area through here could get some pretty good thunderstorm activity today. And we intend to be able to stream live the whole time through our Starlink and our coupled, bundled stuff uh, when there's very little LTE out there. Um, and it's going to be on YouTube. We're going to put it on YouTube and get Mike to do that, so you should be able to tune in and check it out. What have we seen, just to show off a little bit, Frame grab from the iPhone video, nice forked lightning. This is near Chino Valley. Now, the rain is very beneficial, and I realize folks back east, especially Florida, that are like, it rains every day here at 4 o'clock or whatever. Well, it doesn't out here until you get the monsoon coming. And the monsoon is very, very important. You need the moisture. There's just a lot of benefits of it. But one of the negatives is you can get some of these lightning strikes, especially just outside a thunderstorm, where it's not raining, dry lightning as they call it, and you get high base thunderstorms where there's just not much precip, but you still have the electrical discharge building up, and bam, you get a lightning strike with no rain, and what do you get? Forest fires and brush fires. We saw one yesterday. I don't remember the name of it, but it's not far from Prescott in Prescott Valley. We saw the air tanker go right over us. It was like, whoa, uh, where'd that come from? So this is a serious thing. It's an interesting phenomenon. It's a pretty big tourist attraction. Yes, hundreds of people come out and chase the monsoon, so to speak. Um, anyway, nice lightning shot. Just wanted to show you that. Spoke to a couple of people down in Wickenburg yesterday. Nice family there. They own a place. Hey, I'll tell you the name of it. It's called Trader Jays. Again, not a sponsor, just a great local shop in Wickenburg, Arizona. If you ever go there, tell them Mark, the hurricane guy, sent you. Trader Jays. Uh, the two people that uh, run it, they, uh, I don't know like their names. I have never asked their names, but I've seen them a couple years in a row. They were telling me, to get to the point, how wet it was in the winter. We all knew that. But they said that the river, this dry wash that comes through there, the Yassa Hampa or whatever it's called, a uh, Native American name, was full bank to bank for two months. Now, that's the winter time and the big rains that we had out west. Sometimes the monsoon can do that or at least monsoon activity, and you get a flash flood. Anyway, to me, it's just very fascinating. Sorry, I'm rambling on. Let me show you one more thing, and then we'll prepare to get out of here and get this online for you. Also, the outflow creates dust storms. Cold, heavy air, air that's cold is dense and falls, the rain-cooled air spreads out laterally, advection, right, the horizontal movement of air, and you get these dust storms that can spread out. I don't know why Dropbox won't just play it again. Come on. And this is one um, somewhere uh, not far from the Nevada-Arizona state line. There's a wind farm out there, the White Hills Wind Farm or something like that. It's buried in that haboob. And uh, I don't know. It's just really fascinating to me. All right. One of our uh, partners, and yes, this is a paid sponsorship, and I'm very proud to say so, Quick dams, let's get rid of me. They did a tweet today. You're going to learn more about them over the coming months and years from yours truly. Sandbags versus their flood bags. What's that all about? Hey, would you rather fill up bags preparing for a flood with over 92,000 pounds of sand or you get 
all the flood bags you need ready to go, light as a feather, almost, right? You set them up, the water does the rest, filling the bags up, and you fight water with water. To learn more, go over to quickdamswithans.com. I'll put the link in today's description. They are a partner of ours. Uh, yes, one of our funding partners, but a partner nonetheless for an educational campaign about how to be ready for all kinds of flooding situations. You'll be hearing a lot more uh, from me about them over the coming months. Very excited about some of their technology and their products. Quickdams.com. Uh, thank you for being a supporter of our work. All right, so let's get this online for you, and then i got to get out of the hotel and start moving. we got a lot of ground to cover today. Again, hopefully be live on YouTube uh, as long as everything holds up. That's the goal, is end-to-end live coverage today from the desert southwest. As always, thanks for tuning in and giving me a part of your day. I appreciate it very, very much. I am Mark Sutherth, Hurricane Track. I'll be back with you tomorrow.